Well, welcome in. Here we go. We're wrapping up uh, the first full week, I guess, uh, of the federal election campaign. This would be uh, day five or six, depending on how you carve the calendar on it. Uh, the point being that um, we noted this yesterday, it feels like a thousand days already. So uh, normally in, in this slot, we would be recording uh, On the Ledge, which is our uh, Ontario Politics podcast with uh, Keith Leslie and uh, John Wright. And we have been doing so since the writ dropped back in uh, 2018 on the Ontario election. So since then, we have stretched this out into a a weekly with Keith Leslie, who was the former uh, bureau chief at uh, Queen's Park for Canadian Press. Uh, But this week, we decided, John and I, you know, let's go back to the daily and uh, do what we did to, to start this whole thing. And so we have reignited Uh, the writ race and doing a daily. Now, since Monday, John and I have sort of set the framework for what we hope to accomplish here, Uh, but you don't want to be just listening to the two of us. So we thought what we'll do is we'll continue to add some voices. We'll continue to uh, add the uh, usual suspects on our Friday. Uh, So Keith Leslie is here and uh, joining us and also, um, well, um, family member and uh, I guess business partner. I mean, we just have a whole long business card in terms of our relationship. Aaron Trafford joining us, both she and uh, Keith from Nova Scotia. So thanks for uh, getting up. Well, I guess your day's almost over there. You're you're ahead of us in time zones. You're, you're pushing lunchtime on me here. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Early lunch. Anyway. The noon hour special for you. Is that when you go to Keith? <laughs> so, I, you know, John Wright and I have already talked about the campaign in in Nova Scotia, the outcome of that election. I think there's been a lot said um, here in Upper Canada about uh, what is the impact and the effect uh, for the campaign federally. Um, Aaron, uh, you know, I'm not telling secrets out of school, I don't think, but, um, you know, if, if this is, I'm sorry, but the, the most of the parties have approached you to run in, in Nova Scotia. So just curious to get, I mean, so you've had those kinds of conversations at a political level, at the organizers level, just to get your sense of what we missed because people's heads spun when the Tories were elected in Nova Scotia. And it's funny because I got a couple messages from girlfriends, friends, colleagues who are not in our world. They're they're not political people. And that's actually what they said. It was like WTF just happened yesterday. And I said, I called this on day three, went on vacation, came back and it had happened that that the liberals were going to have this huge retreat in the province. So, I mean. Yes, I have been approached. Um, I've been in Nova Scotia now 13 years. I've been approached at every level, municipal, provincial, federal, to run. And every time I say no. <laughs> but Which is the right what, answer, by the way. Yeah. I mean, what are you, nuts? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what, what, there's a few interesting things that I think I just want to draw attention to. First of all, when Nova Scotian politics makes the lead story nationally, we celebrate because rarely are we given that much attention. So this was a big deal. But also, I mean, frankly, Ian Rankin, who was the the liberal premier, he ran. Are we allowed to swear on this podcast? He ran a crummy campaign. He just didn't read the room. Um, you know, when we look at the overall environment that we were living in here in Nova Scotia, the pandemic, we were a leader. At one point, we were the leader in the world in terms of safety, right? We were the safest place to be in the world. Um, And that was under Stephen McNeil. When he stepped down, Ian Rankin took over. It's almost like they just decided to coast on the pandemic as the campaign. And there was just such an opportunity for a forward thinking progressive leader to come in and steal votes away. And that's exactly what Tim Houston did. So I predicted this. Um, I think at the organizational level, the liberals were also a little bit lazy. Um, I have so much to say about this. Keep asking me questions. Well, again, (laughs) Keith, you've got some historic memory in terms of how all this has played out. Now, it's not unusual to see a progressive conservative government in Atlantic Canada, or particularly in Nova Scotia, there's a history there of that. So this isn't a huge shock to the to the uh, political uh, system there. But you know, given the current circumstance, um, there's there's only one 
liberal government now at a provincial level in, in this country? And these, this is the first liberal government or the first government across Canada that held an election during the pandemic not to get reelected. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. A, 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 as Aaron just pointed out, yet it had the best record on COVID in the world and then certainly in Canada. And Nova Scotians are rightly, really proud of that. But again, as Aaron nailed it, you know, they were looking forward. Yeah, you had a great record. Well done on the pandemic. And, and of course, most of that was the previous premier. But, you know, they're, they're giving ranking credit for it. He didn't blow it when he took over in February. But what's he offering them? We've got a great pandemic record. I'm calling a sleepy campaign in the middle of the summer, in the middle of a pandemic, intentionally to lowball this. And then to Aaron's point again about running a crummy campaign, their start was terrible because right away it was disclosed that he had two DUIs uh, about half a lifetime ago, he says, 2003, 2005, which clearly should have been disclosed a long time ago. And if people were even willing to overlook that, you know, and he said, you know, he was youthful and he, he, he owned up to it. But then the day of the election, we learned from this woman who was a candidate in the Halifax area that she was asked to step aside as a candidate because of what were, of all things, that were built as boudoir photos. I'm going to call them lingerie photos, uh, which she had disclosed to them beforehand. Uh, so apparently they, they were worried they got picked up on social media as the campaign picked up. People were raising this point uh, that she had a, a, a page on the what's only what's well, anyway, some website we could buy uh, to look at pictures of her. Uh, and they told her, not only are you, should you now withdraw as a candidate, please state it's your mental health issues for the reason for doing so. Talk about misreading a room. Holy cow. That was just uh, they, they just blew off uh, anybody under the age of 50 with that, that kind of stupidity uh, telling this woman. To go. And of course, she told the honest story. And if you happen to go look at the website for the pictures, uh, she's a woman who's covered in tattoos. And that's really what she was displaying. And she, so the whole thing was just absurd. And I think it cost them dearly. I think that's why Aaron was able to predict on day three, OK, the liberals are going to come crashing down. And they certainly I, I think a leveling was expected that the liberals, they went in with something like a 28 point lead that wasn't expected to hold up. But Tim Houston came in there as a progressive of all progressive conservatives and said, to heck with the deficit. We're going to pretty much double it and put all that money into health care. And another story that came up during the campaign was a woman whose husband fell in the driveway in Dartmouth and broke his leg. And after waiting three hours for an ambulance, she called the police to get him to the hospital. And the police checked in and found out it was going to be another two hours before that ambulance. Ambulance is in Dartmouth. That's not, you know, in in rural parts. This is... This is insane. So health care, uh, access to health care, ambulance services, all key issues. And Tim Houston never came off that once. Uh, the NDP stuck to affordability issues and, and, you know, went on rent control, those sorts of things. That helped them in the, in the Halifax Regional Municipality. Absolutely. Uh, they stuck to affordability. And, and, and there's, you know, the Liberal Premier Rankin saying, you know, what a great job we did. And then he almost disappeared for a while. And their campaign so much resembled, I, I, I can't believe that uh, Justin Trudeau launched his campaign on pretty much the same basis, saying, you know, well, we've got a great COVID record and looking forward, you know, we're the ones are going to mandate vaccines, and which didn't play out the same way he had hoped it would. Uh, I tried to throw a wedge issue right in. He didn't have a solid thing. He didn't come up and say, well, you know, I need to set long-term care standards nationally across this country, which he finally came out and said on Thursday. Give us, he was asked repeatedly for a reason for the campaign. He couldn't give one. And that's, I think, how people viewed it with Ian Rankin uh, here, that there wasn't really any, you know, there was going to have to be an election campaign, but you had no issues, no vision to look forward. Uh, so people went with the vision that was looking forward, progressive conservative, obviously different from the national scene, but still, I think, very, very worrying for the liberal campaign, or at least it should have been. And we started, as I say, later in the week, started seeing some real specifics from them on policies. So Aaron and, and Keith, do you guys get a sense then, just generally, you know, since this has kind of settled over the last three days or so, that Nova Scotia is viewing the federal election campaign differently than they might have, say, a week or 10 days ago. Because once it played out, I mean, even to your point, Aaron, I mean, you, you could feel it coming, but there was still a sense of surprise. I was watching the broadcast from Halifax and... You know, the pundits even were thinking, holy cow, what happened here? That, in fact, it it only reinforces perhaps this perspective that, okay, yes, we need to be forward thinking that, in fact, we what would be a liberal stronghold federally might be a little shaky now. Yes, I absolutely agree. And I think just to build on what Keith said, another interesting there's there's two interesting things that I noticed happen on election night here that kind of our indicators when we talk about um 
you know, certainly that issue that happened with the Dartmouth South candidate, the liberal woman being asked to step aside or for mental health reasons, you know, that to me was a huge indicator that the liberals are lazy with their messaging. And then the they're just not reading the room. The other thing with, that happened throughout the campaign that I think ties back to the COVID thing is that what we saw happen about midway through the campaign is really the liberals. And to some extent, I wonder if this is what the federals are, are the federal party is now kind of looking at is they rested on their laurels thinking that the vaccine passport was going to be the clincher for them. But when you look at that logically and strategically, what that's asking the electorate to do is put somebody in power based on something that has never before existed to combat a problem i.e. the pandemic and the spread of the virus that we have never before dealt with. So when we look at, you know, how we're feeling as voters, we want certainty. We want leadership. We want to know that we are at point A and this party is going to bring us to a point B. And when you base your campaign on something that has never happened before that nobody can really understand, you're making a strategic mistake. And that is what the liberals, I think that was really what was the downfall of the Rankin campaign, notwithstanding the DUI, the way they treated female candidates, the way they tried to sweep that under the rug. I mean, that's just a whole other thing. Also interesting, and I'm just going to point this out, and I don't know what this means yet, but what I noticed, too, um, having covered a multitude of provincial elections here and, and municipal, is that there was a really high percentage of PC candidates elected to province house who were former city councillors in HRM under former Mayor Peter Kelly, who is a progressive conservative. Mm -hmm. We now have Mayor Mike Savage, who is a card carrying liberal and he is now in trouble for how or he's dealing with a lot of hot water and blowback over how the city is handling the homeless issue. So I just see there's this 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 whole new way that we're looking at leadership and issues and what matters and vision. And I think that the Nova Scotia election was really, uh, really put a fine point on everything. So, John Wright, you're the uh, official uh, room reader in this group um, and looking forward now based on what Keith and Aaron just told us and I think painted a pretty good pixelated picture here for us what would you expect do you think that the prime minister looks at this in his war room and says okay normally we wouldn't be spending time in Atlantic Canada but yeah we might want to have some face time with the folks down east I think that they'll have to spend some time in Atlanta, Canada anyways. I mean, <clears throat> they, they've got lots of great prospects there. But I think more importantly, it, it pauses them to look at what went wrong there and to filter it through their own campaign. And clearly uh, what Aaron and Keith have said was that when you come out of the gate and you think you've got it in the bag and you're going to coast a bit, then you're not reading the room and you're not reading the mood of this country. And I think that there's a mood underneath the surface that we're not really watching carefully. People have been um, through an awful lot over 18 months. There is a, I, I call it kind of a subtle road rage, which is just under the surface. And depending upon how people feel, um, they may see something during a campaign which moves them in a completely different direction. I don't think a lot of people are yet tuned into the federal campaign, and so the first week has been kind of a phony war. Um, but it certainly has laid out a thematic, and that is, you know, where Jagmeet Singh and um, Aaron O'Toole are on kind of the affordability side of the ledger. The prime minister seems to be all over the place. I mean, I don't catch a single theme from him. So what that says to me right now is <clears throat> if you want to run a campaign a little bit like Ian Rankin's and and – kind of play, you know, what we did before and what we could do in the future, vote on that because we did a good job then and we can do a good job in the future. It's not going to fly. And secondly, don't take it for granted. Um, so I, I would think that if anything, their campaigns federally are going to take the weekend to reassess where they are. I'd be surprised if the prime minister sticks to his campaign approach in this coming week. But if he does, I mean, there's not a lot of time to pull out of it if things go wrong. If Atlantic Canada is in play, the Liberals have got some issues. Oh, for sure. But but let's look at it this way, though. You know, um, I think it was Rob Benzie at the Star this week was uh, uh, reporting that uh, the federal 
liberals are not going to run against uh, Doug Ford, for example. We're, gonna, we're not going to go down that path. I think that at some point it's going to be really hard not to because as much and all as Premier Ford is saying we're going to sit on the sidelines, you know, his presence is, is kind of hard to ignore. But let me suggest this, and we made the point earlier. There's only one liberal provincial government right now. Now we've got this sort of solid blue right across the country provincially. And we know that oftentimes what we get in Ontario provincially is opposite to what we get federally in Ottawa. So does that kind of change the tea leave read for you? Well, I, I think a lot of uh, provinces like to do what Ontario does. Ontario is just much more blatant about it, that the minute there's a federal government of one stripe, we're going to switch to the uh, provincial government of the other. Um, but I think a lot like that for the obvious reason. It gives you someone to campaign against all the time. The federal government is a great boogeyman for provinces. There's just no two ways about it. And Doug Ford, certainly in 2019, was a great boogeyman, a great foil, a great uh, someone to attack for Justin Trudeau. It doesn't matter where he went, he was attacking Doug Ford. Uh, clearly this time, though, it's, it's you know this is not 2019. It's two years later. Those two governments cooperated pretty well on a lot of stuff during the pandemic. Uh, Ford becoming, you know, virtually best friends with Christian Freeland. Uh, I think that's helped temper the two of them down. Ford's got to run for re-election in, in like seven, eight months as well, or I guess a little longer, about 10 months, excuse me. Uh, so they both got to, you know, watch what they're doing right here. They're going to tear the other one down when they've cooperated so well. I think Canadians like to see cooperation from governments, whether different stripes or not. They want to see federal and provincial governments coming together in situations like this. So it's going to be interesting to see. We'll note, for example, you know, the prime minister has gone around signing daycare agreements with all the provinces, but he has not. And they, that, they launched, you know, the Nova Scotia election, the daycare agreement was signed here, multi-billions of dollars like two days beforehand. They have not signed one with Ontario yet, and I'm sure that's deliberate. I don't think they'll get to sign one during this campaign. But if there is an actual detente and agreement, it'd be interesting to see how it was drawn up and who agreed to it. Uh, but I, I think in the end, as you say, it's going to be too tempting for both sides or one side's going to get just desperate enough. The federal liberals, I suspect, that they're just going to have to drag out Doug Ford and attack him for something. But I think as well, Aaron O'Toole and the conservatives have to watch as well, Doug Ford. I mean, here's Ford getting tough on, on uh, vaccines for a lot of people. And Aaron O'Toole isn't even enforcing them in his own candidates. So that's something, you know, they, they, they don't want to have too much of a wedge between the federal conservatives and the provincial conservatives. So I think all of them are, are leaving that as best they can. But absolutely, the federal conservatives, Mr. O'Toole is doing a good campaign and knowing that he's going into basically home turf and almost all the provinces has got to help that feeling and that confidence when you speak to voters. Uh, I want to get into the provincial vaccine situation in Ontario, but just before we do, Aaron, do you get a sense that we're overthinking the vaccine? Because here in Ontario, 80, more than 80% of the people have one vaccine. Nearly 75% of eligible uh, residents have two vaccines. So it, it's it's pretty easy to get on the right side of that issue by waving the flag and saying, gee, we should all get vaccinated. Do I think we're overthinking it or do yeah. I think we're overplaying it? I don't think we're well, overthinking both. it. Um, I, I, you know, just personally as somebody who has two children under the age of 12 who are unvaccinated, no, I don't think we're overthinking it. But do I think that the parties are harping on it too much? They're letting it become too much of an election issue? Yes, because it is not, you know, we talk all the time about an election campaign, you, you win the election campaign, but then you have to actually govern and you're not going to govern on a vaccine mandate. That's not governance. That's where it becomes public health policy and all of those other things. So what I want to see from the parties, from all of them, and we can talk about what I've learned about what's going on behind closed doors. But, you know, when I've been approached is I want to see issues of governance, right? Right. Tell me you're going to fix this vaccine, this short term end of my nose problem. Yes, please. But also, I, I want to know that we're not going to be back into this cycle in two years time because you got lazy and you got scared and you're going to call another snap election if we end up in a minority situation. Right. We are tired and the vaccine conversation makes us more tired. So are we overthinking it? I don't know. Are we tired of it? Maybe. 
So, John, then back to your point, just to sort of follow on what, what Aaron was saying, you know, the premier here in Ontario saying he wants all of his caucus members to be vaccinated and those who aren't fully vaccinated, um, you know, he's decided that you're out and he's already kicked one out and um, has given an exemption to a second. Um, is this leadership or is he is, is the tail wagging the dog here? Because everybody else has already done that in the legislature and... Uh, you know, as we point out, you know, eight out of 10 people have already got a vaccine in their arm. Well, I think the inflection point on the vaccines came about two weeks ago, where we had upwards of 70% of the people in this province, and now we're getting close to 80% who have been, you know, double vaxxed. <clears throat> and there's a tipping point across the country where 77% of people said, I want to have some kind of identification which shows that I can prove that I got the vaccine. And what's going on here, <clears throat> I think, is that the 80% say, look, you told me I'd be rewarded. You told me that if I did, you know, my good doobie things and got my shots and stayed inside, that I'd be rewarded with a full life and I don't want to be threatened by other people. So I think it it went beyond a moment in time to more of a movement when it tipped over to those those numbers. What's happened in the last week, though, is a telltale sign, and that is governments, transit unions, or sorry, transit uh, unions may be being on side over the next little while, um, uh, stores, um, concert going up, uh, you know, venues. I mean, there's just a slew of colleges, universities. All of them have now fallen into place saying you have to be vaccinated in order to go to one of these things. So it's it's isolated a group of other people. What's missing from this is the proof. Like, how do you prove that you actually have been vaccinated? So Doug Ford has essentially gone. He's read the mood, to put it in Aaron's term. He's read the mood of the the, the room very carefully and said, look, uh, we're going where the rest of the people are going. You have the right to be unvaccinated, but you don't have a right to sit in my room. And so they've moved over. But I think more and more what we're seeing is society itself turning the page and saying, those of us who have crossed over to the other side can start to live a a normal life. But those who have not, you have to stay behind and do whatever you want. Well, interesting, the way that has played out is, is sort of similar to the way the ballot question you and I have been talking about all week has played out. The public is really driving the issue. They have decided that this is what's important. And you had done you your polling this week about, you know, the various um, priorities that uh, voters have. And they are stating their agenda. Here's where we want it to be. So before we go, uh, just back to Ontario politics. And, and for those of you, this is a little bit of inside, you know, baseball uh, going on here. But uh, I have complained over the last year and a half that COVID-19 has made it very difficult to do really good sound accountability reporting. And primarily it's because you're not in the room with them. Keith, you will know better than anybody that you don't get the story by sitting in the committee room, listening to what's going on or in the legislature, listening to the debate. You get the story because you followed somebody down the hall and caught them outside their office or on their way to the wherever, get their hair cut into the cafeteria, it doesn't matter. But it was that one-on-one, it's your ability to have contact with the folks that, you know, you want to ask a question face-to-face, you want to have them accountable. This week, the progressive conservatives apparently had sent out fundraising literature that looked like, well, in no uncertain terms, was an invoice because it said invoice at the top of the email. And there were people looking at it thinking, I got to pay this. Well, our friend at uh, Global News Toronto, Sean O'Shea, chased down the guy responsible for fundraising, Tony Miele, with the uh, Progressive Conservatives. This, my friends, is a master class in how you deal with accountability. Listen to this. How is it possible that the PC Party of Ontario would send out fake invoices, giving the impression that people were obligated to pay when patently they were not? First off, I want to apologize to our donors. It's unfortunate this went out. Um, there's a misunderstanding, obviously. Uh, Hold on a second. I, I, where, where's the misunderstanding? Well, in terms of how people read into this email. So. You said invoice. You said payable. Yeah. You, you made it clear in the marketing that this was money that had to be paid. Again, I'm going to apologize. There was a mistake made, and I'm going to review this with my staff and a third-party service provider who drafted it. So, so responsive uh, I, marketing, I, did responsive marketing draft it? Correct. And yeah. who, would, who would the party approve the, it? These are all internal party matters, which I don't discuss. Yeah. So I am going to deal with it. This will not happen again. 
I apologize to all my donors. And Who's losing their job or their right. contract Thank over you, this? Everyone. That's These are internal matters. I'll, I'll talk to you later. What kind of an apology is? It's not going to happen again. Thank you, no, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Does that, you know, is that supposed to wash? A simple apology? You're going to give, you're going to give back the money to people who gave money? What about that? Door slams. And that was the door slamming on Sean. <laughs> and, it, you know, bang. So, I mean, Keith, you, I, I saw you on social media yesterday talking about that. And I thought, this is exactly what we need in in this environment now. And we have lost that. Oh, uh, have we ever. Of COVID. Right? And we've and, lost it. We'll lose it on the campaign. Because, again, people don't really understand how limited and restricted accessibility is on campaigns. So, to get to all of these points that you've all made about holding their feet to the fire on vision, on reading the room. We don't get to do what Sean did enough. No, we don't even get close to do it. <clears throat> and something, by the way, that opposition politicians don't get to do in question period either. The format just doesn't allow it. It's in those one-on-ones, those scrums later, those those just corning someone and just talking to them, pushing. No, no, wait, come on. Your talking points are meaningless here is essentially what Sean was saying. Your apology is meaningless. He's pushing you with real, who's going to pay? Are they going to get their money back? You know, real questions. Real. We don't get to do that with standing at a unimic with one question and we're tossing it over and we might get one follow-up and there's a lineup of people behind us. I remember going way back, I think it was the, 2006 uh, federal election, I was on the Jack Layton campaign. Mr. Layton, you know, he's going to take all the questions. No, he would take five at a stop. If we had two stops a day, he would take five, two of which were going to be French, one of which was going to be local. So two of the rest of us that are paying to be on this campaign, and we would have to get together. You talk about packed journalism, just to negotiate what couple of questions, because we all needed answers on a couple of things. Then our desk would call in and say, well, we need this too. Oh, Everyone limits questions, during, especially during elections, and we never get the right Q&A back. That master class from Sean should be played in every J school. Yeah, I just thought we, it, was, it was important there, not just because it's uh, good Ontario politics coverage, but uh, generally uh, what we'd like to see uh, out on the campaign. Uh, Aaron, Keith, John Wright, thank you. This is The Writ Race. I'm Dave Trafford. Uh, we're here every day, so uh, join us. Get, leave us a uh, comment if you like. If you like it, of course, subscribe and, uh, and share it. Uh, and in it, by the way, it's an eye contact podcast.